Hey, everybody. Welcome to Fresh Take from What Fresh Hell? Laughing in the Face of Motherhood. This is Amy. Today, I'm talking to Minna Dubin. She is the author of the new book, Mom Rage, The Everyday Crisis of Modern Motherhood. Minna's writing has appeared in the New York Times, Salon, and Parents, among others. And as a leading feminist voice on Mom Rage, Minna has appeared on MSNBC, Good Morning America, and NPR, among many other places. Minna lives in Berkeley, California, with her husband and two kids. Welcome, Minna. Hi, thanks for having me. So this book began as an essay in the New York Times that really yes. touched a nerve, including with, with Margaret and me and with the listeners of our podcast, called uh, The Rage Mothers Don't Talk About. Tell us a little bit about that essay and how it came to be. Sure. Um, that essay is from another book that has never seen the light of day. <laughs> that happens. But it all worked out perfectly, <laughs> so it's not a sad story. Um, and uh, I saw New York Times parenting was new at that time. They had just, you know, created that vertical. And um, the head lead editor, Jessica Gross, was put a call out for kind of the hard parts of motherhood stories. And I had that essay already. And I was like, I have a hard part of motherhood yeah. story and uh, got it into her hands. And and they said, yes, let's do it. And I was very excited and absolutely terrified to put that out into the world. Right. Because you feel, I mean, we did a whole episode on on that essay and the feelings that it brought up for us and, and what mom rage was. And I'll link to that in the show notes. Um, but what the experience that you said you realized once you heard from hundreds of women and it, it was that each one of us thought, oh, I'm the worst mother in the world. Nobody else would ever have these feelings, have these moments. And then you realized, actually, no, that wasn't that wasn't the case at all. Right. And then I'm having that experience. Right. Because like it was like this amazing like circle. These mothers were like, oh, my God, you said what I've been feeling. I'm not the worst mother. And then I was like, oh, my God, I'm not alone. I'm not the worst mother. You know, it was like it was happening in succession, which and it, it was it was very exciting for me, you know, to get that feedback. And so then that became like there should be a book about this so that everybody knows this wasn't just this isn't just you. This is this is a thing. Basically, yes. There was another New York Times article about mom rage in the pandemic because it just, got, you know, everything just got worse once the mm -hmm, pandemic happened. Mm -hmm. And then after that, it was like, OK, this is like an international emotional crisis that's happening. And there needs to be a book about this because this is a phenomenon that nobody's talking about. That's right. That's right. So so you spent about three years talking to 50 mothers from yep. a, a wide variety of backgrounds. Yeah. And. Uh, I'm curious how you defined mom rage going into writing this. And then after interviewing 50 women and spending all this time writing this book, how how that might have changed? That's a big question. So, so where did it start and where did it get to? I mean, it's a great question. When I when I first wrote The Rage Mothers Don't Talk About, that first essay in The Times, there was zero uh, like social overlay. It was just about me and my fury in my home. That's it. I didn't talk about society. I didn't talk to, about the social neglect of mothers. I wasn't talking about uh, families and husbands who are not supporting mothers. Like it was just like it was kind of like I am a wreck. I didn't say that, but that's what I felt like when I wrote that piece. Mm -hmm. And by the time like now at the end of the book, right, the book is done and the book is really like I'm taking society to task really with this book and it, the book is really about the societal neglect of mothers. It's also very much rooted in the home. Like I tell all I tell my story. I tell all these mothers stories. I'm talking about, you know, I'm not I'm never saying it's OK to rage because it's society's fault. Like it's still not a positive thing. Right. But it's really about mothers and the social structure. And it really like I feel like I am mapping out the cultural architecture that sets mothers up for this experience. Yes. That like set, this is motherhood is a setup for rage at the moment. Yes. Yes. There's so much. You you give the example in the book that there's a a mom that that a kid knocks over a bowl of Cheerios. The mom blows a gasket and it's bewildering to everyone around her. It's seemingly out of nowhere. And the kid is either scared or once they get older, like my kids, they're like, oh, my God, like, relax. Right. That sort of reaction. <laughs> To, to something that does seem very out of nowhere, maybe even to me. But but what that mom rage is, is 
is a huge, long, long thing with many parts that probably started long before the Cheerios were spilled. Yes. It's like it's like as if behind her is like complete darkness. And then what the book, what I aim to do with the book is to like pull away that dark curtain and to show what's actually been happening both like that day, that month that year, the last hundred years that that (laughs) make that spilled Cheerio reaction of rage totally understandable. Right. So so mom rage, I'm going to read your own definition of this here. You say mom rage is a complex, multi-phase, physiological and psychological cycle. It's not just uh, somebody who flies off the handle out of nowhere for no reason. It's it's something that's that's there and has has a cycle. And that's that's but one part of the cycle. Right. And that's another like that's part of the black curtain, right, that we don't know anything about. Right. Like so when when we scream (laughs) before we scream for possibly weeks, there has been rage building inside of us. And what we don't realize when we feel so terrible that we screamed is like what a what a great job we did for all those weeks leading up to that rage. All the times we were like, just a second, honey. Oh, oh, mommy will be there in a minute, right? Like the hundred times that we were perfect. Right. 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 When like when the rage was like incrementally rising. Right. And and often for other people, like you were you didn't lose it with that waiter who was so rude to you two weeks ago. Yes. And then the Cheerios just they just send you over the edge. Right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> yes. So there's there's five stages. Uh, there's five phases of this mom rage cycle. So the first one is the ramp up. You called that. Right. Which is what I described of like the rage, like slowly, slowly Slowly. brewing. And you don't even know it's happening sometimes. Like you Uh, don't you don't even realize that that's happening inside you, that you're you often don't realize that you're incrementally getting more irritated and more irritated. Yes. Yes. I mean, in in retrospect, it's often pretty clear. But right in the moment. Or it's just people are slowly becoming more annoying to you all of a sudden. Right. (laughs) I've been in this case like, why is everybody annoying me today? But that's you're in the mom ramp up. Then you call it the emotional whack-a-mole. So, so what is that when we're trying to sort of keep it in? So, yeah, the, uh, you know, the arcade game whack-a-mole where the little thing comes up and you smack it down with a mallet. Yes. Um, so as, uh, as women, um, we learn to push down our anger and not to show anger because anger is yeah, specifically in women seen as like an ugly or uh, not okay emotion to have. Yes. And also part of it is just like, time management like we don't have time to flip out every time we feel upset you know and I mean we have to get dinner on the table we have to get the kids and so emotional whack-a-mole is when we feel the frustration coming up um just pushing it down and being like I'm not going to flip out right now you know and moving on not dealing with it in any way and because we don't deal with it then the next phase is the rage phase which is when it pops out so fast that we it feels like we have zero control over it because we've been smacking it down for hours or days. And then after that, we quickly move into what you call the shame spiral. Right. That's when we feel horrible that we just (laughs) yelled at the people that we absolutely love the most. Done that. And then short-term repair, where we sort of, mommy, sorry that she yelled. Is that what short-term repair is? Exactly. Mommy, sorry that she yelled. There's no but attached. It's just, Mm -hmm. that was not okay. I'm not allowed to do that. You don't deserve that. You're good. Like, We all mess up. Here's some things I'm trying to do. You know, how did you feel? You know, just a real conversation trying to um, trying to reestablish the connection and make whoever the rage recipient was feel kind of loved and safe. And a point you made that I was new to me was it totally makes sense to me that by the time you have this moment of rage, one has a moment of rage that it's been probably building up for a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. But then after the rage, it isn't like. Phew, I feel better, right? That, and and that, that actually the ramp down can also last for quite a while. Right. A- apparently, physiologically, you are more likely to rage in the coming hours and days after you had a rage. Your, your excitation levels are, are, are still ramped, now, maybe not to the degree, you know, of when you raged, but they're higher than a flat level zero. And let's talk about dad rage and why there's no book about <laughs> dad with age is it because is it because uh men traditionally are allowed to express anger more consistently along the way and they don't swallow as much of their emotions is that why uh that's part of it i mean men it's not men are celebrated actually for being angry they're rewarded 
in in the book, I talk about a study where um, people in the workplace looked at angry women and angry men and uh, associated angry women with a lower status in the company mm. and men with a higher status in the company. Um, and so in our society, men are allowed to rage. And they we also look at men, at angry men, and we think that their anger was warranted, that it was situational. Like, well, he got angry, but, you know, that was a really annoying situation. Like the kids were being super out of control. But when a mom yells, we look at it as a character flaw and not situationally. And mm-hmm. it's because she is, I don't want to say the B word, but, you know, fitter, <laughs> shrill, other B nasty, words. all the yeah. other words that we yes. associate with mean women. Yes. Um, so and, that's and, part of it. And the anger is not to be taken seriously, right? Somebody who's, who is uh, shrill or whatever, like her anger is annoying. It's not to be taken seriously or, or, exactly. or considered. Exactly. Exactly. And then also, um, you know, the expectations on mothers and the expectations on fathers are completely different, both in terms of like workload and the overwhelm around parenting that mothers Mm -hmm. feel versus fathers and the way that mothers and fathers are viewed in terms of their parenting. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, we also view ourselves in those same ways. Like when I rage afterwards in my shame spiral like the, well, just the fact that I have a shame spiral, right, is specifically gendered, whereas ah. men forgive themselves for their rage in that same way that other people forgive men for their rage. And they're like, ah, eh, you know, like they're not worried that they were a terrible father. And because motherhood is the pinnacle of womanhood when you are and, and angry is the worst thing a mother can be. Yes. If you're an angry mother, it's the worst thing a woman can be. Sounds Whereas familiar. it's not the yeah. same for fathers, right? Because right. fatherhood is not the pinnacle of manhood. And so, oh my gosh, right. Yeah, right. it's just. There, there's so much to unpack here. We're going to take a quick break. I'm talking to Minna Dubin. She is the author of the new book, Mom Rage. You argue in the book, Minna, that there's sort of one, one big thing with many parts that's underpinning mom rage. And I want to make sure we talk about this. It's the societal neglect of mothers, which has many parts. Can you walk us through that? Sure. Um, I mean, there are so many ways that mothers specifically in America don't get supported. If, If we look at motherhood from like a policy perspective, we are, you know, there's so many things that mothers need that we don't have in America, which I think most people who are probably listening to this this podcast know, right? We don't have, we don't have paid family leave. We don't have universal child care. It is very challenging to get mental health support. The postpartum period is basically um, seen both by the society and in the in the medical community as being like 12 weeks, even though it's more like a year. And, you know, and so people who do end up having uh, postpartum mood and anxiety disorders, it's much harder to get support after 12 weeks. Like for myself, I didn't get, um, you know, no one was giving me the, the checklist of like, how are you feeling today at nine months, which is when I really started feeling ragey because I was weaning my child around nine months to a year. But like right. no one's giving you the checklist then. Right. And, and is there a connection between um, sort of postpartum mood disorders and, and mom rage? Is there like a one to one connection? There's not a one to one connection, but it's also not unrelated. You know, mm-hmm. like the the thing that makes it fuzzy. I mean, and this is related to the to the uh, how long we associate the postpartum period to be right. Like. If I'm raging at like three months, one might get cued in to be like, oh, maybe this is anxiety or maybe this is related to depression because rage can anger can be. Uh, a symptom of depression or anxiety. But anger can also live by itself as something that mothers experience without having anxiety and rage. And one study showed that mothers were more likely to be angry than they were to be depressed. Interesting. But at the moment, there is no postpartum anger disorder, right? Like, <laughs> right. it's not, I don't know that it won't, maybe it should be, you know? And the other, the other thing that makes it sticky to connect them is that you know, if I'm raging and my kids are six and 10, do we call that a postpartum mood and anxiety disorder? Right. <laughs> you know, and, like, 
and maybe it doesn't matter, right? Maybe maybe it doesn't matter. Like there there are there are emotional uh, ramifications of childbirth yeah. and postpartum for women, and then there are emotional ramifications of primary parenting without proper support. Yes, right. They don't they don't yes. ha- they don't have to be tied together to matter. Right, and 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 another reason why I feel uncomfortable to connect them is because. If we say that rage is a biological condition, it makes it pathological as opposed to this is an ordinary reaction to to systemic oppression. Yes. Yes. Okay. So so we have the the lack of of societal supports. And then on top of that, there are sort of more cultural considerations, which is which are things like that the the mother is the primary parent. And right, I, mother, I would argue the more of this you do by yourself, the better you're doing, right? The better, the better you, you're perceived as doing. What do you mean? Like when my babies were little, I was handling all the night wakings because cause that's what a good mother does. And I was breastfeeding and I was doing it. And I know I got it. I got it. Right. And I, I felt like by some, you know, invisible group of judges, I guess, that I'm doing a better job if I'm handling all the things a mom is supposed to handle and not right. needing help. Absolutely. And sleep is another uh you know, a, a, another uh, like reason that people rage as well because of lack of quality of sleep. That was one of right. the things that I that I found in my research. Mm-hmm. And when you look at when you look at moms and dads, moms are having so much less good sleep, even even once um, even once they're finished nursing, it continues. Um, and 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 I talk about in the book, like you know. My sleep was mes- messed up for years because, I mean, once nursing, I would nurse two kids and then there's, you know, wetting the bed and some kids have night terrors and some kids just don't sleep that well for like till they're like five. Like there's like a thousand reasons, like for eight years, my sleep was interrupted. Right. right. And you <laughs> always have once you're the primary parent, I feel like if breastfeeding meant, meant that you were the primary night getter upper, then you, your body does sort of maintain that vigilance. Totally. I'm always more tuned into footsteps in the hallway than my yes. spouse is. Yes. And I think that good mother pressure continues way beyond that first year, you know, of nursing. It, like I, I talk in the book about the PTA and like the pressure at schools and like the pressure to be like involved. And that's what good mothers do. You volunteer to be the room mother and the PTA president and like da 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 da. And it's just like really all of it is labor that's supporting the society that has disinvested from supporting us and our children. And you you argue something in the book that really surprised me. I hadn't really thought about this, that the idea that the mother is the primary parent, that that wasn't always the case in, in parenting literature, that they weren't always synonymous. Yeah. At the beginning of the 1900s, parenting uh, advice, pamphlets, and books were not written to the mother. They were written either to the father or to just parents in general. And it has totally changed to be the mother. It's a big idea to sort of realize that the idea that we've been fed all our lives, that women are just better at, you know, either want to do it more or are just better at all the caretaking and things that need to happen is, is a construct. It's not, it's not true. Yeah. I mean, mothers used to be revered for, for fertility, for being able to carry children and birth them, but not for raising them. The whole raising children as a mother's job is like a fairly modern idea. Absolutely fascinating. Okay, we're talking to Minna Dubin. Her book is Mom Rage. When we come back, we're going to talk about strategies. Minna, I wanted to make sure we had plenty of time to talk about strategies because, as you say in the book, the rage is natural. We understand why it's happening, and it is often pretty justified, but that doesn't free us of responsibility for how we express it. That's right. And we also don't want to feel rageful, obviously. Like, this is no way that any of us seek out or, or want to feel. And, and the things that we do to either numb or escape or whack-a-mole, they, they work, but not forever. Okay. And so what do we do to start to identify this for ourselves, maybe without shame, but, but to work on, this is how I see this coming? Walk us through some ideas on how we might start to recognize this in ourselves differently. Sure. Um, I talk about a couple strategies. One of them is called, I call invite your rage to tea, which is about, um, switching our mind frame around our rage. So, in, you know, for me, I have felt very ashamed of my rage and wanting really nothing to do with it. 
And um, I advise, you know, or do myself to invite my rage to tea, which is instead to look at your rage as a friend instead of an enemy and to get curious about it and to sort of look at it like a sociologist, like to start taking notes on your rage. Uh, when do I rage? When Let me look at location. Like, is it always in the house? Is it in a certain room? Is it always in the morning during the morning rush or like around dinner time when everyone is hungry and tired? Um, are there certain things like what is there? What's the trigger? You know, is it always is it always cereal? <laughs> <laughs> right. Or right. Is, is it you know, in it, the kitchen? Right. Right. Or, that makes so like much a, sense. It, or is it a certain way that my partner talks to me? You know, like like figuring out what it is, because underneath those are answers um just so, some of the answers might just like for me right one of my one of my triggers is around teeth brushing i like i always get uh frustrated around teeth brushing time and so one of my strategies what instead of you know being mean to myself about about my anger was to try and find a different solution and to and to ask myself like in a gentle way is teeth brushing going to destroy you tonight? And if the answer is yes, like to my if, yes, right? Because <laughs> maybe the answer is yes, right? Maybe, like maybe maybe I know I will not survive it. <laughs> if the answer is yes, then being like, okay, you know what? And I'll say to my daughter, come here, I'm going to brush your teeth. Like I'm just going to do it for you tonight because I cannot tell you to brush your teeth and stop zoning out a hundred times tonight. I will not survive it. You know what I mean? Like to to switch it. And another um, another strategy is to engage your partner. I think mm -hmm. with with for moms who are partnered, especially to men, um, the rage can kind of drive you apart and you don't want to talk about it. You don't like it just is this thing that kind of lives between you. But your partner is actually the person who knows your rage the best aside from you. And they can observe you. If you can bring them in as a as another sociologist to watch you, they can start to watch you and notice um, what you do physically when you're about to rage. So, and I, I share this story in the book where I ask my partner to to observe me, and we have this conversation, and he, and then he says to me in the middle of it. Well, we made we made a code word, so that's another idea. Are you in the yellow zone? That was our code term. Um, and I stopped and I looked back and I realized my voice had just dropped an octave. My hands had jutted out in like a duck bill, you know, where I was like I was gesticulating intensely, like, <laughs> and I and I slowed my enunciation down to like a fine point. I was like, I will allow you like I was talking just like that and then I and then I kind of focused on like what were the hurt places like because underneath rage is often is often hurt right is often yes. sadness and once I recognized like what was happening for me that I was actually sad about I just involuntarily burst into tears and then my husband came towards me and hugged me instead of running away from my rage which is what he actually wants to do right <laughs> Right, because right. it's right. It's scary. It's driving people away, and what you yeah. need is support. Right, yeah. we're 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 working against ourselves when we when what we need is help, and we're asking for it sometimes. Yeah. Like like we would say about toddlers in the most unlovable of ways. It's not our fault, but it's not it's not getting us what we need. Yeah, not and as support. I say as I say it out loud, I'm realizing that all three of those examples, the teeth brushing, um. And the invite your rage to tea and then bringing your partner in as allies, all three of those are really about embracing. The first one was yourself. The second one was your rage. The third one was your partner. Embracing these different people, if you want to call rage a person, instead of pushing them away or being angry at them or hating them. Yeah. I mean, I can think of one mom rage moment that has really stuck with me. I had two little kids and I was pregnant with number three and I was like on day four of solo parenting the two mm -hmm. of them and pregnant and I just you know I just lost it and and enough that I frightened my uh my older kid who was four at the time and you know made him cry and like and, and I was you know mortified and I was more afraid I was so ashamed to tell my partner about it and yet I knew that I should because 
nobody was hurt, but it, you know, it, it just was like, I, I was, I was at my breaking point yeah. and I broke yeah. and I felt like my parenting partner needed to know that even though I really, really didn't want to tell him. And he responded with so much grace and so much understanding. Mm-hmm. And, and that was very helpful to me. Um, but getting that sort of shame out of the way, like they, they are the person who's going to be there to help you. And in, in that case, the situation was clearly like, okay, maybe you shouldn't be parenting on your own right now. Maybe we should, <laughs> maybe I shouldn't be traveling so much. Right. It was, there's a, there's right. an easy fix that right. does not the involve fi- me hiding it from him. Yeah, totally. The, and the fix is that like the information that you learned from bringing in your partner and like being honest about that moment is that you required more support and you should have more support, whether that's your partner not traveling as much or you guys figuring out a support network for you when you're alone with the, you know, with your child. Right, right. Because when we blame ourselves, you make this point in the book so eloquently, when we blame ourselves for our rage, then society gets to do the same thing too. Right. Just stop being like that. Just relax, right? Then nobody, nothing has to change. Everything can stay the way it is. Yeah, chill out. (laughs) Chill out, right, right. (laughs) And as right. my as my co-host would say, if she was here, nobody in the history of the world has ever chilled out from being told to chill out. And we usually talk about that in relation to our kids. We can't tell our kids to calm down and expect them to calm down. But so right. much of this is like, or even even the things we've been talking about, about get curious, you know, do a little bit of detective work of when does this happen? We give that same advice to uh, the parents who listen about like, if your kid is always having a meltdown on Thursdays and Thursdays is karate after school, then maybe you drop karate after school. Like get curious about what the whens and where's. Yes. We really have to do the same thing for ourselves. Yes. And if if we blame ourselves and society blames us, then like everyone, including us, is against us. Right. <laughs> like right. and and all of the blame is in our lap, which leaves society scot free of any culpability or responsibility. Yes. 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 Sounds familiar. We were just talking about this in terms of um you know, social media and the algorithm and, and that it, so much of that gets put back on like, well, moms, just don't let your kids be on screen so much. You, you are not as strong as a screen time algorithm, but as long as we can keep blaming it on mom, then nothing has to change. Right. And this is something right. like, we ha- this has to change. And the pandemic, the last point I wanted to make is that the, the pandemic was sort of a, a, a breaking point for all of us. I feel like I'm almost like, this can't keep going this way. Um, did you, did you find that for the women that you interviewed that the pandemic was a, was a turning point? Yeah. I mean, the second article that I, that I wrote for the New York times about mom rage and the pandemic, I wrote it because, you know, the first piece came out in September and then the pandemic that was like March, April, I started all of a sudden, like all those months after that first piece, I started getting all of these emails again. Like all my inbox started filling up out of nowhere. And I was like, what's going on? Why am I suddenly getting emails about this piece? And I realized it was because moms were like Googling mom rage. Moms were losing their minds and uh, searching for some sort of like answers or solace. And that's why I wrote that piece. And I think that, yeah, I think that the pandemic was um, really painful for moms. And that I think, you know, moms and especially poor moms and moms of color, um, but really all moms like took the hit of the pandemic in a lot of ways because we were the ones when push comes to shove, moms are the ones who stay home. You know, even even working moms like working moms had to stay home or working moms had to quit their jobs or working moms had to, like, pull back their hours. Like so much of it fell, I think, on the mothers. Yeah. The subtitle of your book is The Everyday Crisis of Modern Motherhood, that mom rage is an everyday crisis. And I love that term because it makes it sound at once common and worth paying attention to. It is both of those things. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's fun kind of trying to create the subtitle. Yeah. You know, you don't think about that, like people sitting around like batting subtitles back and forth, but But the word every (laughs) day, but we do, (laughs) the word every day did feel important because I wanted to normalize it in the title because I think that the phrase itself, mom rage, can, for some people might feel like, whoa, that book's not for me. And so I really wanted to put every day in it because I actually think it's quite normal unfortunately. I think it is too. Minna's book is called Mom Rage, The Everyday Crisis of Modern Motherhood. It's out now. We'll put the bookshop link uh, in the show notes for this episode. Minna, tell our listeners where else they can find you. 
You can find me on Instagram at Minna Dubin, and you can find me on my website, which is www.minnadubin.com, and all of my book information and also my book tour, which will start next month, uh, is on there. Congratulations on the book, Minna. It is a really important, exciting, vital read, and I encourage everybody to get it. Thanks for talking to me today. Thanks for having me. This was fun.